get information and rare diseases because now we are making rare diseases to patients not only looking, looking for genetic counseling but also for optimal of medical care. Hello, thank you for this introduction. Um, just a short um, question. Could you stop the screen sharing from uh, Oliver Stefan so I can share my screen, please? So in the meantime, my name is Christian Gebhardt. I will uh, discontinue the video due to the um, connection just so you can see the slides reliably. Okay, so uh, today I'd like to um, present our platform, Find Me to Care. Um, it's a platform to contact patients with uh, rare genetic diseases. And um, to begin, I will uh, point out uh, three points from uh, the status quo of genetic diagnostics in um, Germany and uh, this platform is at the moment targeted at Germany so many aspects will be uh, focused on uh, the German um, um, the German um, situation so uh, the diagnostics in Germany the genetic diagnostics is uh, done in many uh, highly professional and uh, high quality labs but spread across all the rep um, the country and the diagnostics, however, are printed on paper, the results, and sent by mail. That's the standard how information is sent to uh, the treating physicians. And uh, the other thing is that genetic information is uh, considered very um, sensible in uh, Germany, um, as in many other places. So uh, the lab is only allowed to send the results to the person that is responsible for the medical treatment who has um, asked for the diagnostics. Um, the report is then, or the, the results are then presented to the patient by this um, medical practitioner. And uh, the, the report then, even after uh, com um, communicating the results to the patients, can only be passed on to other physicians uh, only with uh, expressed um, consent by the patient. So this is a very, um, a very protected information. So uh, from our own uh, um, experience from our um, office, uh, where we see many patients with genetic diseases, we have uh, seen that many of them have a lot of questions uh, when they uh, finally get to know the diagnostics after a long period where they maybe have uh, traveled to many uh, different uh, specialties and finally there's a genetic diagnosis giving a name to the syndrome. And these questions might be, um, who's an expert in this field? Who's, um, who can I go to with specialized questions? Is there uh, treatment available already? Or um, if, if not, how can I stay updated with uh, recent uh, publications or news about uh, my disease? Can I even be part of research and um, help to uh, get along and or get, uh, bring the field uh, further on? And also, is there other uh, people with uh, the same disease? And um, some of these questions we can answer when we communicate the result. But uh, in cases where uh, there's ultra rare diseases, this is maybe something where we where there are no treatments, where there is not many um, research available, and there's not yet a specialized center for something. And um, this is why we think one of the best ways to um, enrich the, the experience for the patient or to help the patient even prospectively into the future is by empowering them to stay in the middle of the process. So um, patient empowerment is the way how we wanted to address this um, situation. And this is the, from the Bundeszentrale for für gesundheitliche Aufklärung, a definition. Empowerment means that uh, patients can use their own resources to design and shape their own lives. And further down, they say that the goal to achieve this is to create conditions um, that allow the patient to um, autonomously decide uh, what to do and uh, to, to, to shape their own life. So with this in mind, we, we created Find to Care where the patient is in the center. So the patient itself or himself uh, herself registers to the database. So uh, this is something that can be done, done autonomously by the patient. But what was important for us is that 
the medical data, the genetic data submitted by the patients has to be correct, has to be precise, and has to be complete, um, which is uh, not easy if the patient would have to type all this data manually. And the next thing is the patient, uh, patients themselves should be the ones who are contacted if there are news regarding their very own situation. And so what information should patients get by Find Me to Care? It's about um, current treatment options or new um, scientific discoveries that relate to them. If there's um, studies recruiting patients with their disease, if there's new projects, new patient registries that are collecting patients to um, systematically um, assess uh, phenotypes, for example. But also if there's patient organizations who seek patients to uh, increase their reach and also um, families or uh, patients that seek uh, look for other um, affected uh, persons they can uh, share their experiences with. And this is what we want to deliver with Find Me To Care. So uh, in one sentence, Find Me To Care is a diagnosis targeted uh, contact platform. And <clears throat> So this is the basic idea, but what data do we need to achieve this? First off, we need uh, patient data like name, uh, birth date to identify them. We need a contact address, email address, for example. And this is something that the patient can uh, provide. But then there's medical data here as MDAT. Um, and that's the, the, the genetic variation that's causing the disease. That's the symptoms, not as free text, but as structured HBO terms. And there's also helpful metadata from uh, the lab is um, where was this, the diagnostic performed with what method and on what date. And so these two parts, these can be provided by the laboratory. And to, um, <clears throat> to transport the information from the laboratory to our database, we use something that's called a phenol packet. And um, some, some of you might know it, some others not. So just a sh short excursion. Pheno packets are uh, standards developed by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. It's an in international standard describing how information about the patient, about the disease, the biosamples analyzed, medical uh, treatments, but also genomic variations, phenotypic informations, and how all this should be um, compressed and put together so everyone using the standard can understand uh, perfectly what is transmitted. And just an example, this could be a text file, for example, that's like a hierarchical tree structure uh, describing all this information in a standardized way. So um, that's all good. But as I said in the beginning, the reports with the genetic diagnosis and the symptoms uh, reported to the lab, um, they are transferred by paper. So what does a digital data standard help to, uh, to in this situation? And what we want to do is to help re, let's call it re-digitalize this analog um, data uh, by using pheno packets inside a QR code. And by using this, the patient can scan the QR code and then have the, the printed data digitalized again so he can transmit it to our database. If you want, you can try this out now. You can uh, take out your smartphones and scan this barcode if you're interested and see what it does. Um, so behind this barcode, I'm seeing some are trying. Um, so if it's not working uh, immediately, this is what your app should show you. If you're using Google or Android, it should work in all cases. And this is one of such text files of a phenol packet. And you see there's coded the disease of a Marfan syndrome, and you have the ACMG class five variation a variant in FBN1 gene. We have the complete HGDS um, nomenclature and it's heterozygous. And this is how we put the medical data into a machine readable format inside a QR code. In our report, this could be, this is a uh, invented uh, laboratory. This could be, look like this. You have the, re the regular information that's in our report and also you include the QR code and this can be sent to the physician that's ordered the diagnostics and he communicates the result to the patient and passes on this paper and then the patient can move on uh, and go to find the care and use the QR code. So what do patients do then? And I want to show you the process now and then later I will talk about the, the, the privacy related uh, issues and how we solve them. So the patients have their report with the QR code and they register to find me to care. 
uh, they pass on their own contact data and they scan the medical data with the QR code. And so from then that moment on, the patients are in our database and are findable. Um, and what, who could find them? So for example, we have researchers, we have uh, physicians in specialized centers, we have patient organizations here, and we have other families with, or even patients themselves who are affected and are looking for other patients as described in the beginning. And how would this go? They make uh, an application to a contact application to find new care. They provide criteria who they are looking for, maybe specialized criteria like specific symptoms, and uh, they provide an information that should be passed on to the patient, like a, uh, like a document or with contact info and uh, info about the project and uh, as a PDF, for example. This goes through an uh, independent scientific advisory board as um, to, to show, to, to check if this is a valid application. Um, this should be um, like a, a sorting for priority. This should just um, assess if the information provided is uh, valid and if the uh, the the person or the institution asking is a serious um, institution. And then the database can be checked. We look for patients who meet the provided criteria, and then we pass on the information to these patients. They can read it. They can um, decide for themselves if they want to react to this contact um, um, application. And um, if they do so, they can contact the person or who has made the application. And this is the basic process. Uh, and I will show you a few special examples in the end. So um, let's talk about a few um, key aspects of privacy. So one thing is the patient is the one or the parents of the patient, um, the ones who register. So they themselves give consent that the data is used for this purpose. and um this is this avoids that um they have to wait for a appointment of a specialist who does this the registration for them uh, be it time uh, with a time a problem or a location problem for them to travel somewhere they can do it themselves from their uh, home and um then for the lab the situation is this uh, there's no specific um consent needed before the diagnostics because we are not using any more data that it's uh, than it's already needed for making the diagnosis. So there's no additional data processed. And also the lab does not send any information to find your care. Uh, they are processing and cre creating the QR code locally on their IT systems where they also create the report as, and all the last steps needed for transmission of the data is done by the patient themselves. Then next uh, is that nobody from uh, other projects is uh, allowed looking into the data. They are protected in a very secure manner. The patients can rely that we are not passing on their uh, critical and sensitive information to other uh, third parties. And these are the main aspects of finding the care for the privacy. I will just go into a few details. Uh, how do we store the data? We chose a separate um, um, <clears throat> approach where we separate the medical data in a separate server. We have the interface where the patients um, are working with, they are logging in and uh, checking and submitting their reports. And we have a separate identity management system that uses pseudonyms for every single component. So the, the, the data linkage of the several data points is only possible via the um, identity management. And apart from the storing, um, also the transmission of data is um, critical and there's one point where the data of medical information and the personal information is transmitted at the same time and this is when the patient registers the report uh, so in theory be it um, from uh, unknowingly um, using an unsecure wi-fi or using an unsecure phone for example um, or even if there's malignant uh, actors who are have hacked the patient's computer or whatever, um, this would be a moment where they can get the medical, the, the genetic, maybe stigmatizing genetic diagnosis and the patient's name, and this would uh, could become public. And to prevent this, we chose an approach where we end-to-end -end encrypt the medical data. What does that mean? End-to-end um, -end encryption means that the laboratory encrypts the data 
before printing it into the QR code. And only when the data is transmitted to the medical database, there it will be unencrypted. You can check again with your smartphone if you want to check this QR code. Um, what you would see is you would see now uh, that there's a report from, in this case, the MGZ Munich where I work, uh, created um, the day before yesterday. But then the rest of the message is just garbled signs that doesn't don't have any um, sense. And nobody can decrypt this except the server where the medical data is then stored eventually. Not even I could decrypt it at the moment. Um, only if it's submitted by the patient, this could be uh, decrypted. Um, so just to show you this process again, the laboratory would encrypt the medical data, print it in the QR code, then the patient would register uh, with a login, email address, contact address, and pass the medical data by scanning the QR code, but it's only decrypted in the safe um, and protected medical database server. So these were a lot of theoretical concepts and ideas. I want to make this more palpable by presenting a sample patient, but with a, a real uh, disease that's uh, been described recently. So we have a patient, let's call him Max, um, or John Doe, as you would say in English. And he's three years old. He has a developmental delay. He has a seizures and he has a short stature. So after a lot of um, pre previous diagnostics, there's a trial exome analysis, and uh, we find a pathogenic variant in the ADNP gene, which uh, causes a Hales mortal van der R syndrome. The treating uh, pediatrician or even the genetic counselor, they find uh, no therapy studies currently uh, done in Germany. Uh, I actually checked yesterday and there's nothing um, registered in clinicaltrials.gov in the European side. Um, there's one study in New York, but it's not a treatment study. It's just to assess information of, about symptoms. So the, for the family, it's not an option to go to travel to New York City for just for that. And there's no German speaking uh, patient organization. And so the result would be the patient is being um, transferred to the local SPZ. And he is treated very well according to his needs for symptom based. The epilepsy, the seizures is treated, but um, that's then how it would stay for uh, the near future. How could Find Me to Care enrich the situation? So, if the patient would get a report with a Find Me to Care Q a QR code, the family could then register to Find Me to Care. And from that moment on, they are in the database and can be found. For example, in the first step, they would themselves ask, are there any other families um, that have the same symptoms? Remember, there's no German speaking patient organization with a website where they can go to and get informed. And in this case, we could uh, check and find other families. And if those families, then we would tell these families, look, there's someone asking for contact. Here's their information. Do you want to um, answer this contact application? And if they do so, they can um, call the new family um, John of John Doe, and then uh, they have are in contact from that on. Now, another sample is, let's say after a few years, there's a new patient registry or patient um, organization forming, and they look for um, patients with Hales mortal van der R syndrome, and they go to find the care, they provide information for the patients they want to recruit. Um, and after evaluation by the scientific advisory board, the information is passed on to the patients. And if they are interested, they can contact the patient group and become members and um, stay even more connected to others. And what's probably one of the more most interesting cases for uh, many of you in the audience is what about how would um, studies or um, new uh, research uh, benefit from Find Me to Care. So let's say in the case of ADNP uh, variants, um, they are uh, investigating a drug that should target the uh, targeted help epilepsy in ADNP patients. So they um, supply the criteria ADNP pathogenic variant plus seizures as criteria. They provide the study information for the patients, and the information is passed on to those patients who meet these specific criteria. And um, from those, maybe one family is not interested because the seizures are already uh, treated very well at the moment. It's not the right situation for them. But the others who are interested, they can contact the study center. And from then, that point on, they can be recruited and uh, take part in the research. 
Okay, so at this point, I have finished giving you an overview of the project. Uh, one important question now is, okay, that's a nice concept, but when do you start? And we will start very soon. I, I will just show you when we started working with this. It was 2021. We had the idea, let's put some QR codes in a, uh, on a report. And then we started working with partners uh, to make uh, to see what's feasible technically, but also from privacy point of view. And we started the, the, the detailed development of all the components in March 2022. And one year later, in March 2023, this year, we were um, confident that we can already present the project on the National um, Convention of the German um, uh, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Magnetik. And we had great feedback. We talked to a lot of large um, laboratories from across the country. And many of them, or all that we talked to, basically uh, said, you, um, they want to take part, they want to put QR codes on the reports as soon as, as it's possible. And uh, later this year in June, we presented the project in the TMF um, AG Datenschutz, the privacy working group of TMF. Uh, it was a great uh, discussion there. And in the end, uh, we were invited to provide a um, written um, privacy um, a concept or a plan uh, that can be formally assessed by uh, the TMF. Uh, and that's what we handed in in September. There were another uh, another round of uh, discussions and um, recommendations. And we plan to bring in the final version for a positive formal uh, votum in November. Uh, at the same time, uh, in October, at the moment, we test. You, we finally tested all the information, uh, all the the processing of data, all the techniques, uh, technical stuff from creating QR codes to registering for patients. So this the technic technology is ready. We are currently working on the administrative um, conditions uh, that have to be met, like proper information for patients, um, contracts with uh, data um, uh, um processing partners and internal SOPs for who's responsible for what, et cetera. And we are uh, sending out the first reports with QR codes in November and start a pilot phase where at the moment, the laboratories from MGZ in Munich and Amedes Genetics will use QR codes on their reports. Uh, but as I said before, it's an, it's an open initiative. We want to include as many laboratories as possible because this lives from uh, best um, participation of many uh, laboratories so uh, many patients can register. It's an open um, initiative pre-financed by as a joint venture from MGZ and Amidas, and we're not trying to make uh, any large profits. It's uh, so use will be free for patients, for the laboratories, and also uh, for, for academic um, researchers who want to look for uh, patients. We will not charge fees, but uh, on the other hand, we need to pay the service somehow, let's put it like this. And um, so, for example, we could think about if uh, pharmaceutical companies or from the industry, they want to recruit patients, uh, then they could pay a fee so we can refinance what has been um, spent already. But as it's a non not really for profit uh, open initiative, and we hope that many participate. And uh, I hope that so the first results, we will present them on the BVDH Tagung in November, uh, end of November, uh, where we can uh, then give you the first experiences of the patients that um, have uh, registered so far. So with that, I'd like to thank all the partners who were involved in this. Um, if you have questions now, I'm happy to answer them. Um, also, there's uh, Professor Angela Abicht uh, on the location. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask her during the break or after the session, or you know the game, you can scan the QR code, get my contact details and uh, call me or send me an email in the next days if you have any questions. So thank you for your um, attention. So Christian, thank you for this um, exciting project and also the enthusiasm you put in to and you and your team to make it work. It's a great achievement. I think what helped is that you had the, it's patient based. So the parents and the families, they give their consent. But one question you mentioned um, that I have to the last point. So um, will there be a governing board to decide who will have access to this data? You said if the pharmaceutical industry will have 
want to inquire about this database and so on. So how is this uh, basically organized? Or we yeah, that's, organized? A, that's a good and important question. So um, no one, be it industry or academic users, will get a view of the database of the patient data. It will think of it like a, a data one-way street where somebody provides information and says it should be passed on to these patients that meet these criteria, and then we pass this information on. And to avoid that there's, let's say, spam going to the patients, we, uh, we will uh, build an independent scientific advisory board that evaluates these, um, uh, these requests for contact. And um, we plan to um, address the European reference networks for rare disease, because there's a lot of experts there who know the field in several uh, sub-disciplines. And we, um, we we hope that we can recruit uh, many experts who can evaluate uh, these contact um, requests. And of course, if it's an industry that has, let's say, more just financial interests uh, by doing the, but often you have joint ventures from uh, industry and specialized university um, centers work together on treatment studies. So uh, I don't think it's just the industry that wants to can contact patients, but if so, the scientific advisory board will evaluate if uh, this is something that's worth to be passed on to the patients or if it's just advertisement and we will not pass on uh, blunt advertisement, of course. Okay, thank you. So one urgent question from the auditorium, there's one. <clears throat> so thank you very much for the exciting talk. I have two qu small questions uh, regarding patients. What happens to the uh, report or um, when the symptoms of a patient change over time? So let's say he stays in the database with the uh, symptoms that he got during um, consultation and the first diagnosis, and then over time symptoms change, uh, something changes after treatment. How can that be followed up? Yeah, also important question. Uh, people live and so should the database. I mean, they persons, the patients change. And um, what will be possible, so what, first thing what we want to do is uh, we want to contact the patients regularly, let's say once a year, to ask if there's any news regarding their contact address, contact details, anything else. Um, also, um, treating uh, geneticists or um, uh, specialized centers, they could then uh, create a QR code with an, using a um, pseudonym that we can then link to the record that's already in our database. So they don't, the, the centers don't have to know anything uh, that's in the database. They just, so say you go to a follow-up meeting at your uh, geneticist and he makes an updated QR code. The patient can scan this data again. And in our database, we can um, link this and update the information in the database. Thanks. The, <laughs> What are the criteria for the centers that write the reports in order to participate in this endeavor? So um, uh, we start with um, genetic laboratories where there's, uh, because the, the initial phase is basically linked to a clear genetic diagnosis. So uh, we, we think that the best data quality regarding the genetic variation should come from the lab that does the, the report in the beginning. So we will start there. And um, those laboratories or the Genetik or Fachärztin, they will be able to create these QR codes in their labs. In the end, uh, we have to see as uh, this is an ongoing project, um, what is the demand? Is there uh, how we can, we can help create a living database? And um, if you have feedback and say you're a center for um, certain um, diseases, you have a great expertise. Let's talk, and we we have to develop this. It's an ongoing project, and um, so if you have questions about this, feel free. I, I can't see you in this morning, so I don't know <laughs> your name or who, where you are. So I'm sorry about that. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, okay. So thanks. I see there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about the project. One, the last question from Professor Winker. Well, there may be a critical question. Who owns Find Me to Care? Yeah, I good think question. it is set up as a German company, say as a GmbH mm -hmm. under public law, and uh, it entirely 
depends on the trust of the patient towards that company, the reliability, the stability, and the trustworthiness. Well, the genetic community had some experiences with that. The most uh, um, uh, remarkable experience was decode genetics in Iceland. It started as a benefactory enterprise and it ended as a plain entrepreneurship driven company. And the patient who once relied on that can do nothing about that. Well, who owns Find Me Genetics? That's my question. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. I think that's an important question, uh, but I guess you had some legal counseling about this. Yes, sure. Uh, so it's a um, it's a GmbH as a joint venture. Maybe there's Professor Avich coming. Oh, maybe your 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 basically your boss wants to answer. Would you mind, Christian? Yes, of course, please. Uh, Christian, maybe you're happy when I'm helping you. <laughs> so, of course, you're right. At the moment, it's a private initiative. That's true. But this GmbH has no, um, they, I'm not legal too, but it has no Gewinnerzielungsabsicht. So it's not thought to earn money from this. And, of course, you're right. This is not, you could plant it somewhere else too. But now this is the first sprouting of it. And I think it's in all our minds every day when I'm doing reports, I think it would be such a nice thing to already have this QR code on it. And um, so if there are other partners who want to join this GmbH, they, it's open, just contact us, yeah? Yeah, so I think this is a good, that's I think it's great that we have this discussion here and also we bring up this kind of controversies and as a community, technologically and also from the medical part. So I suggest that you continue that in private, also in a small group. There will be more information on the Find Me to Care on the Gestalt Matcher booth or stand. You can go there and have a discussion and ask yourself. I think we need to continue with that. So um, we are quite advanced with the time, but I'm very excited to present now uh, Professor Kohlbacher, Oliver Kohlbacher from who's the bioinformatics professor and chair from Tübingen. And he will present his scientific endeavors on personalized medicine and data integration. I think that suits very well to the first talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can and yeah, thanks for the invitation. Can you guys hear me okay and see my slide? You see your slides. All right. Okay. All right, let's get on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll do that a bit quicker than I had intended to because I was supposed to be in another meeting in three minutes. But um, I will still uh, I, I'm still hopeful that I can give you an idea of what's going on with the DNPM data integration platform DNPM DIP and and how that relates also to the developments uh, in the rare disease community. The starting point uh, where this all came about was in 2015 when the state of Baden-Württemberg decided to fund centers for personalized medicine at uh, its comprehensive cancer centers in, in Freiburg, Heidelberg, Tübingen, and Ulm. And the goal of the project was to harmonize and, and, and establish quality assurance for the complex personalized medicine workflows around personalized oncology. And then to bring these molecular tumor boards that were established, the MPBs, together and make the data um, captured there available um, for research. So this initial project um, was uh, led to the definition of a core data set, of roughly 150 attributes that capture um, the whole case and personalized oncology, uh, some genomic information, just variant information, not the raw data, um, uh, some anamnesis, uh, all the way up to the follow-up that um, can be captured for a longer ex extended period of time. Um, these core data that are now being uh, standardized as part of the medical informatics initiative and the project here for Onco that you might have heard of. But it is just the um, formal description of the case. What we also needed was an IT infrastructure that can deliver that. And that was a companion project, BW Health Cloud, 
um, which um, set up a federated pseudonymized uh, aggregation and provision of the MTBK data. So basically all the data resides at its various university hospitals, five of two Ulm Heidelberg, but they can all talk to each other. So the data is stored securely at a university hospital. So even though it is a cloud, it is not through commercial cloud providers. That's an important point, I think. Um, and through this, we can now collect the evidence for um, uh, personalized oncology therapies and also enable the research uh, use of that data. So I'll not go into the data model for lack of time, but the idea how this works is that oops, every uh, site, every university hospital has its own documentation system um, on how to capture um, the uh, structured information that comes out of molecular uh, um, tumor board. And we map that, transform that to this core data set. Um, we have draft standards of pseudonymization uh, mechanisms. And that um, through this, the data is loaded into what we call the BW Health Cloud backend. There's also a front end that I'll show you in a second. And all that is hosted in the clinic. Everyone sits on their own data, but these backends are connected. They can talk to each other. And through this, they can show you data, all the data at all the sites. And that is what forms this BW Health Cloud. It's just the union of these, in this case, four node, nodes, and every clinician at their side can look at their own data, but they can also enable one checkbox and then actually see all the data nationwide. And I'll give you just a very quick idea what that looks like, so people can log onto this system, can see um, the various, uh, can search for various mutational gene names. Um, basically, in this way, stratify the cases that they're interested in. And um, if they click on this button without noticing, they not only search for their local data, but they also search at all the other sites. Um, you can then drill down, look at what therapies were suggested, um, which drugs were used, um, and then there's a, a very nice interface that enables the navigation of all these cases. Now. Um, this is currently being rolled out um, across all the other German uh, university hospitals or, or initially comprehensive cancer centers. Um, that's DNPM, the German Network of Personalized Medicine. And here we are now facing um, the challenge to scale this infrastructure up to a larger number of sites. Initially, the DNPM project will work on, in oncology only, but it's also envisioned that this should be rolled out, for example, to inflammation, to infection, uh, where also molecular data plays a major role. So within this DNPM project, we have been using the infrastructure that we built for the ZPMs, the BW Health Cloud, and turn that into a tool that can be scaled up for uh, a nationwide uh, project. Um, so we need to harmonize the processes and data exchange a bit. And that means we are, we are moving towards HN7 higher for that. Um, and we also needed to revise the data governance a bit. At the core of it, however, is that we also needed to change the architecture. So in Van Württemberg with four nodes, every node can talk to each other node. But if we scale that up nationwide, um, we um, we needed to change that architecture a bit. So now every node does not talk to every other university hospital, but actually talks to a central broker. Um, this broker can be reached either directly or you can uh, use the clinical communication platform of, of, of the German Consortium for Translation and Cancer Research. Um, but the idea remains the same. The data resides in the back end. You can have a front end to look at the data, change the data. Locally, the data is provisioned through uh, an API uh, that streamlines the integration of existing uh, platforms, existing pseudonymization mechanisms. And then without noticing, your query is processed not just by one university hospital, but actually by all of them. Um, now, when we had that in place, um, there started another project, and that's Genome DE, which um, is intended to build a pilot project 
for genomic medicine centered around rare disease and cancer. And this project was funded or is funded by the Federal Ministry of Health and has four focus areas, namely standards um, for the uh, um, generation, evaluation and use of the genomic information, a nationwide platform for genomic data and uh, LC challenges and, and patient involvement. Now, what can we do there? Um, as part of this project um, within various working groups, we have been uh, we have been coming up with a IT infrastructure to actually share the data. Um, and this data infrastructure uh, has various components um, of interest to us, uh, primarily clinical data nodes. So the idea is that the university hospitals that, that are sequencing their data um, would then submit that to a clinical data node. And their data services, for example, discovery of, of similar patients that can be run on that. And based on discussions with data protection, it became pretty clear that um, we need to keep the clinical data and the genome data apart. Uh, so the clinical data will go to clinical data nodes and the sequencing raw data will go to a uh, so-called genome data center. This was a purely theoretical construct until um, the Ministry of Health decided that there is a model project, uh, paragraph 64, Sozialgesetzbuch 5. Um, you probably know about this uh, as, as, as well as I do. Um, this project will hopefully start in March 2024, and um, the uh, Federal Agency for, for Drugs and, and Medical Products BFARM has been tasked with operating a data platform for the project. So what we thought is we take the infrastructure that is there because there's literally no time um, to develop a new data infrastructure from the starting point of this project um, until uh, the, the inclusion of the first patients, which is, as it seems like now, probably going to be just a day. So we thought the only way we can make this work is by using and reusing existing data infrastructure components in this platform. So it was um, decided that the clinical networks like the German Network for Personalized Medicine or, sim or similar ones should operate the clinical data structure where they capture structured information on a case or for every case. The National Research Data Infrastructure, GHGA, the German Human Genome Genome Archive, will operate the genome data centers. And the Medical Informatics Initiative, the MII, will contribute um, components it has been developing over the years, including the broad consent as well as, as local trust centers for the pseudonymization. Now, how will that work? As it is planned now in this model project, the university hospitals provide the case data and they will need to pseudonymize the case in two different ways. There's going to be a clinical and a genomic pseudonym that is generated by the local trust centers of the MII. And then the genomic data, the raw data, basically fast or BAM files go to the genome data center and the structured clinical data of the respective network goes to the network. And each network, six networks are currently on the list, provide the so-called central clinical data nodes through which they can forward the data to the genome DE data platform, uh, which means um, forward them to BFARM, which can then analyze the data. So this is a, um, a short, um, short term view of that. It will need to be expanded as the, uh, um, as the um, initial draft of the law stipulates that the Robert Koch Institute, RKI, should provide a central trust center. But at, at the moment, it seems like RKI can only be able to operate this trust center in 25, 2025, 2026. Um, so once that happens, this whole process will become a bit more complicated. Um, here, the pseudonymization then goes through the central dust center, but I don't have the time to go through that in, in, in that much detail. What we thought is in order to make this also work for rare disease, we might 
use the existing infrastructure we have for oncology data um, and develop a new data platform, RDDIP, um, or develop is, is, is a big word. The idea was that we have the existing software stack, have the deployment concepts, and even have the templates for contracts, data protection, documentation, et cetera, from DNKM. So basically clone that thing and change the front end to um, satisfy the needs that we have for uh, rare disease cases. And for that, we get some seed funding from Genome VE. And we use the data model um, from the Exoma G spreadsheet uh, together with Peter Kravitz. And we hope that the rollout of this can actually be done early next year. Um, we have some prototypes for that. And um, I skipped the data model again, but I could just give you some mockups that we have been using. It will look very similar to a DNPM dip. So you can search, you can search for HPO codes, you can search for uh, genes uh, and variants, and that will provide you an initial rather compact uh, result view. And then you can drill down, you can basically click on each of these cases that you see here in a table, like manner, drill down to the individual case and in this way explore um, the data set in a, in a very convenient manner for all those cases that are part of this model project. So what would be the next step to make that happen? Um, we are currently finalizing the data set description, com uh, complete the data backend that is basically done and are now uh, getting some user feedback to finalize the graphical user interface. And on the legal organizational side, um, what is now needed is to take the contractual framework that we have and, and adapt that to RDDIP and uh, get the data protection documentation in place for all the sites. Um, I'll stop here um, and I'd be happy to take your questions, um, but not before I, I thank a few people, uh, primarily in Tübingen, uh, Lucien Claire and Aiden Jean Pollatkan have been implementing the prototype and uh, much of that was driven by Nisa Malek, Yvonne Möller. And um, uh, in Bonn, Peter Kravitz has been instrumental in, in providing us with guidance when it comes to rare disease. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Oliver, for this uh, nice presentation and also thanking us to uh, catch up with the time so we can ask a few questions now. No, everybody is impressed, also hungry. So, um, to one practical question that we see also, my junior co workers always asking me for them, it takes a lot of time to convert the clinical information that they have in the, let's say, say common clinical notes into HPO codes. Right? So, do you also have some projects to facilitate this? Not at the moment, no. Um, uh, this project um, is, is really about making the already documented information accessible uh, across sites. Um, so unfortunately, that's not within the scope of what we're doing at this point. Other questions? Okay, maybe later, so we will write to you. Okay. Absolutely, anytime. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks to Tübingen. Will do, thank you. Okay. So um, <clears throat> you already mentioned that we now finally ultimately have a nationally medically based genome project in Germany. And I'm happy and proud to welcome the next speaker who has, and I think this is Professor Greuter Kieslich. She was an accomplished endocrinologist at the Humboldt University in Berlin and later also at the chair and um, deaneries of various universities, among the Charité and also Heidelberg. And now she will tell us how we are going to do it in Germany, the medical based not model for haben genome. De.
Wo ist Rana? Wir haben es hier drauf, aber noch nicht da. Ja, ja. Okay, ich brauche jetzt ein Papier. Ähm. Ja, dann haben wir es. Ja. Das kann man in Schein. Was ist das? Ja. Jetzt kriegen wir jetzt auch noch den. Ja. Jetzt geht es. Ja. Okay. Okay. Ja. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm I feel kind of honored, and uh, because I'm of course not so deep into the novel techniques as you are, and pro and what I will be telling you is more kind of wrap up or motivational uh, speech to tell you how important our I mean the revolutionizing technologies are also for rare diseases and what we have to do. And um, I had prepared this presentation in German and only found out this morning that everybody else speaks English. So I try to do most of the slides, uh, translate them in English. So if there are a lot of typos, I apologize. So this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit, give you an overview over rare diseases in general, then a little outlook on some of the international projects in, in genome sequencing that are running in Europe, then a use case, um, then a little bit about genome DE and a summary. So when we talk about rare diseases, I mean, it's always uh, the conflict between, so what the, the healthcare system has to care about rare diseases because they are so infrequent. But when you look at them in general, it's only in Germany, at least 4 million people suffering from rare diseases. And when you look at OMIM, I summer, I, I, sum, I looked at OMIM like many people go to the stock market and look on their shares. I try to look frequently into OMIM, what the figures are. And when you see almost every working day, one new disease is added to the list in OMIM. So when we say we have now more than 7,000 uh, rare genetic diseases, this is probably completely underestimating because it's still going on. New diseases are identified, as I said, almost every working day. And I'm not a molecular biologist. I'm not a human geneticist. I'm a pediatrician. So this is why I always work with the topic of rare diseases because 80% of the patients with rare diseases have some symptoms already in their childhood. And many of them have really compromising severe neurological uh, or motoric diseases. And there are a lot of challenges of rare diseases to the healthcare system or in the healthcare system. And the major one is diagnosis. It's hard for patients with rare diseases to achieve a precise diagnosis as early as possible. And there are other things like the small numbers, the rare, the rare, very rare targeted therapies that we have so far, the insufficient number of clinical experts that can take care of the patients. And we have in Germany no systematic nationwide registry. And we heard about some attempts really to collect more, more data to have a better basis for that. And for research, it's the same thing. We deal with small numbers, so it's very hard to reach significance. There is a low interest in medicine and also in academic medicine and in basic science for rare diseases, unfortunately, because it's such a promising 
area. And of course, there is a very low interest of pharma in uh, research and development and to find uh, drugs because of the uh, market that is overseeable. And as I always say, rare diseases are no colibri diseases. When you deal with rare diseases for a long time, you really learn that they actually are the best examples of precision medicine that we have. So frequent diseases, they split now up into many, many subsets of rare diseases. So there's one disease like diabetes now splitting up to several or many, even many mechanisms. And rare diseases help to understand mechanisms of frequent diseases. So there are several diseases who have uh, finally at the end uh, downstream one mechanism that is disease or disease causing or causing the major uh, symptoms. So, and this dichotomy between rare and frequent diseases, which is a constant discussion in our healthcare system and also in the ac academic medical system, the university hospitals. <clears throat> so, the, actually, this dichotomy is wrong because these two areas are deeply connected as well as in basic science, as well as in clinical science. So, and this is not new because already <laughs> Mr. Garrett has said, the study of nature's experiments is of special value and many lessons uh, which rare maladies teach us cannot be learned by other ways. So, Coming now to the international projects that are going on, and Genomics England has been the first. And I remember that my life, <laughs> I have two professional lives, the one at the bench and in the hospital. And then in 2008, I started as full-time dean at the Charité, and then <laughs> the director of the University Hospital Heidelberg. So I have two lives. And it was in my first life, so it was before 2008, that I really saw what was going on in Genomics England, that they were setting up a structure, a national structure to run, yeah, to run the services that are needed in the area of genomic medicine. And this is a long time ago now. And they have succeeded and they were able also to adjust the system to changes that are going on. So this is something we should have taken early on as an example, how we should structure a genomic medicine, especially for rare diseases in Germany. But there are other examples around, for example, in Denmark, there is the Denmark um, connection of the HPCs, the healthcare providers and uh, an, a central genomic database. And they have a very simple, found a simple way to finance this. It, it's coming from the nat national budget. It's coming also from a private foundation, the Novo Nordisk Foundation. It's coming from business. So they had a, they have a big pot now of money and they are running this. And already by May, and this was presented at the Genome DE conference in Berlin, they had already 14,500 genomes that they had finished. And when you look here for the rare diseases, it was 4,000 already in May, 2023. And here is another example, it's Sweden. And in Sweden, again, they have seven genomic medicine centers and they have uh, also structured it in a central uh, database. And again, also presented at the conference in July in Berlin, already 5,800 patients were sequenced um, by 2022. And of course, I mean, these, and, and I'm, I'm just coming back from Finland, where the FinGene project. So of course, the Scandinavian countries, they have the advantage that they also have the clinical data via a social security number that they can, can connect to the genomic data. 
But they are also resembling Germany because they have a healthcare system where the, where the patients are insured, like at BNAS. And our advantage in Europe is that we have these healthcare systems, starting from Bismarck, compared to the US, where still only half of the citizens are insured. We have this, and we should, in responsibility, <laughs> I mean, for the citizens of Europe, we should put any effort in taking advantage of this because in other areas of the world, many patients will be excluded from genomic medicine because it's still expensive. Here in Germany, they are included via the healthcare system and our healthcare system has to pay attention we have a, I see we have a responsibility here. And in this responsibility of many <clears throat> of the European countries in, in 2020, uh, 2018, they have agreed to have the one plus million genomes project. And Germany here depicted with an arrow has signed this. And as you can see here on this side, rare diseases is one pillar in this one plus mi million genomes project, European project. And the commitment is there to do it. We have signed it in Germany. So we have to do everything now that we will contribute according to the contract that we have signed. Now coming back just to, to, to show you what genomic medicine can do from one example of my own group. So in 1998, we have identified here uh, the first mutation in the pro-opium melanocortin gene. Before this, in the literature, it was said, people with uh, loss of function mutations of the POMC, they cannot survive. It's such an essential uh, function, so they wouldn't. So we described this, and the major, one of the major features of these patients is early onset severest obesity. So they start to gain weight in the first three months of life because they have no appetite control at all. And so we identified two patients. And it took that long to convince a little company in Boston to do with us an IIT that they provided us with an MC4 receptor agonist that we tried in a in the charity in a setting that was not really a CIU. It was everything else. It was a small room in the outpatient <laughs> department, but we succeeded. And it was published in the New England Journal and these patients were treated. But these were two patients, only two patients. Now 120 patients in the world are known, still giving a prevalence of less than one in a million. In Germany, these two patients have been identified in our clinic within three years. Up to now, no other patient in Germany has been described since 1998. So this shows us that in Germany, we have a real problem to identify patients with ultra rare diseases. But from these patients, it was then tried to use the same medication in, in patients with another severe obesity phenotype, the leptin receptor defect, for which it, no cure was available. And it was, it, we succeeded. And in 2023 now, the substance was also licensed for the treatment of body beetle syndrome, another syndrome with severe early onset obesity. In, in, in the US, in Europe, and now also in Germany. So if you take these experiments of nature and you are stubborn enough, you can really, you can really make a difference for these patients because they all have normal weight. So, but when you look, how do we look in Germany at the topic of rare diseases? Usually we think of the rare disease less than one in 2000 like cystic fibrosis. But 
we have to focus also on the patients here with ultra rare diseases, for example, the POMC mutation. And for these patients, we need more collaboration, really to identify them and find people that are stubborn enough to uh, pursue a therapeutic development. One of the things was translate numbers. So this was a project that was funded by the insurance companies and the GBR Innovationsausschuss. So we teamed up in seven centers in Germany for rare diseases. And there were 5,000 patients who were undiagnosed. In them, in 1,300 of them, there was gen genome sequencing done following case conferences where human geneticists, the, the medical doctors, bioinformaticians, and other people decided that this would be a case for, for genomic, and 30% of the cases were solved. 60% remained unclear. But from these 30% of the cases, there were 350 different genes that caused the diseases. And especially, there were more than 50 diseases that were only described in, in the 10 years before of the, you see here, 300 variants in genes were, the, the genes were known less than 10 years. So, yeah, we have we faced the diagnostic odyssey, and this is was this uh, calculated by Genomics England that the family spent six years before they got a diagnosis. In the translate numbers, the par the patients, the, the little children had more than four years in the system, the adult patients and adolescents had more than eight years. So they calculated that it's clearly worthwhile, worthwhile to do such an effort like they did in Genomics England. So why do we need Genome DA? As I told you, we still, despite our possibilities to do genomic diagnostics within the academic system, but also outside, there are still many, many undiagnosed patients. The number of patients of many ultra rare diseases in Germany, therefore, is not known. But there are emerging possibilities of genome based therapies. And if they sh should be brought to success, we need a collaborative genomic database because this natural history that we will find there is necessary for licensing and also for reimbursement of the drugs if they are developed in the so-called AMNOC process that we have. So it's, it's not ending with the diagnosis. This is all needed also for the therapeutic development. And you heard this before, there were two major strategic aims of Genome DE, and one is that we need really to go for, for to find somehow a pace with the international developments. I think I can, I can skip this because you all know that the Genome DE is connected to one plus million genomes, but also to other uh, major strategies of the uh, Ministry of Health, but also the Ministry of Science and Education. And we have to face if we will not start with genome DE soon, the world is turning and it's turning fast. And I put this slide in this morning after I've heard the talk from, from uh, the researcher from Canada, because we have now tried to, to treat patients first to, to show that the PMC methylation uh, is accompanied by an increased risk of obesity. But we also showed a first proof of concept, which is in this paper in Science uh, Translation in Medicine, that this therapy also works 
in patients who have a hypermethylation. So we go beyond the genome. That's what you were talking about here. So how can we keep up internationally if we don't have a, a common yeah, venture like genome DE? And the world is turning because now it's one point was, so what are you going to do with all the variants of unknown significance? But the world is turning here in the science paper in September, the Google team opened a new avenue, how to be quicker in identifying the USs. And the world is turning because now Genomic England has started to pick up new one screening. So they have embedded in the um, Genomics England strategy, now a project on newborn screening. And they have identified, as you can see here, and released this in October, 223 different uh, actionable diseases that they now will screen in 100,000 newborns in England. And as you can see here, one of them is pro-opium melanocortin deficiency. And I bet they will find what a lot, not a lot, but many, while we in Germany still have the two from Berlin from 1998. So the world is turning also in Germany. I mean, we all really want genome DE, but since it's not coming, there is no <laughs> Bavarian genomes. And we hear the developments in Baden-Württemberg. ZPM plus. So we are diversifying, but we shouldn't because we are part in Europe. We have undersigned a contract and in the future, European collaboration will be crucial really to have really a voice also in genomics medicine in, in this world. So, but as we all know who are coming from Germany, we have missed so many opportunities in Germany. When we look at our railway system on electromobility and many, 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 many other examples, we know that there is not, I mean, there is not the right approach to embrace uh, new things and, and go forward. So the structured centers for rare diseases in Germany, which exist now since 2011, 13, still they are not financed. We have no national registry. The offer codes, we have a regulation now for the hospitals that patients with rare diseases have to be um, offer coded, but it's not done yet, despite the regulations. But this is only for inpatients. The majority of patients with rare diseases are treated on an outpatient basis. And there so far is nothing regarding offer codes. And genome DE is delayed now by three years. So this is a picture I took from Peter Kravitz because here, I mean, we have seen many of these things in many presentations today and everywhere. But what is really important is the collaboration. And I think this is a problem we have in Germany, that it's very, very difficult to get people together to collaborate on, on topics that are of national importance. And genomic medicine is a topic of national importance. And we have risks. It is like always, like with our railway system, there is no deficit in knowledge but we have a deficit in performance or in umsetzung. The patients with rare diseases, they are really dependent on genome DE. It's not a hobby that we are doing there. They are dependent on this. And research and innovation in rare diseases and beyond, because I showed you the connection between rare diseases and common diseases. We will not be competitive in Germany if we don't start really a major collaborative act. 
So Genome DE must really set up the common database that was just mentioned. So this was until recently not really clear if this would happen. So to my knowledge, now this is in the mind of the people that this has to come. But how? Hmm? It's not a, <laughs> we are not missing knowledge. We are missing again performance. And what I think is really, really crucial. When patients with rare diseases look on our healthcare system and also on the research system, how we, I would say, behave, they will lose even more trust in the system. They don't have much trust, but they will lose the rest of trust they have. And this is a slide that I always use at the end of my talks. I mean, what for what are we doing this? I mean, it is for children. Many of them, or most of them are children, and they have a lifetime to come. If you can make a change just in one of them, I mean, this is so rewarding. So for my next professional life, I definitely would do the same, but probably at the crossroads of being a dean, I would stay on the other track. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Peters, for this exciting TED talk. I think there will be many discussions and also many questions. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm very happy that you don't ask me any difficult technical <laughs> questions. Here. So I think for a question, I have. There are many things. <laughs> Despite the fact that every word which you said should be written in bold letters. Having said that, that you are viewed as a, one of the mothers of what is called in German Wissensgenerierende Verdorbung. That means knowledge generating services. The German health system is unique. It is quite strange. There are no such systems in over all over the world, except in Germany. And even the, the words are lacking in English, for instance, gemeinsame Selbstverwaltung. I do not know how to play that. And that has got consequences. Mm -hmm. Finally, the payers, the insurance companies, the public insurance accepted what is business generated on the Versorgung. Mm -hmm. It was a long struggle. In part I don't know. But it is, and that is, then I come to my question. My idea, and I would wish your opinion on that, to hear your opinion on that. In my view, that is not a one way road. Of course, during the services, the routine services, there will be knowledge generated. And that is not for free. So insurance companies have to set aside some money for that. And in your slides, you, you can identify that with the money. So, but there are cases which cannot and cannot be solved within the routine service, and they cannot adequately be served by that. And there are cases which at the same time have the research interest. Mm -hmm. And so one could expect that the university centers take care of that and take care of that outside of the reimbursement of the public insurance companies. But that is not implemented. And even in these, uh, in the genome, the E and some of the there is not a word about that. These, these, these reverse direction, these uh, the counter current to the one way. What is your what is your solution? Are, are there discussions about that? I I never heard uh, reflections on that, but I would wish to hear your opinion. What? We, we have the system that at the university hospital level, you have the funding for health care that's coming from the insurance companies. And we have the funding of Forschung und Lehre, as you know, research and education. But of course, our budgets for research and education at the university hospital, I mean, this is almost eaten up and fixed by, by the education of students. And there's some money left where, when you apply for like big big grants like the SFB or or other initiatives. So 
actually, this is what in Berlin, <laughs> I tried to tell them as a dean that we would need a budget for patient oriented research or knowledge generating <laughs> research and healthcare. Um, and I mean, you know, there is now the Berlin Institute of Health. Maybe you have heard of it because there was the Max Delbrück Center for Molecular Medicine, which I, I was amazed when I became a dean that many at the Charité didn't even know about where it was and what it was doing. I was knowing this because I was co-working with them. So we tried to put the MDC and the Charité under one roof and then at least have access to the Helmholtz technology platforms to do, for example, uh, genomic analysis. We were successful, but it's, of course, not, I mean, this is something that could be done in other places as well. In Munich, probably it is now <laughs> with the approach. Of course, it could be done in Heidelberg with the daycare flat. So there are ways within the system. You don't have to invent a new system for this. There are actually not so complicated ways. And I tried in Berlin, I tried in Heidelberg, and I only can refer to the, to the slide of Peter Kravitz, collaborate. This is an issue. It's very, very difficult to get people to collaborate. Also es verbindet sich dann mit den Ideen der Bereitschaft zusammenzuarbeiten ohne die Unterfinanzierung. Es ist, es ist beides. Also es gibt natürlich ein, in, in Teilen eine Unterfinanzierung. Natürlich könnte, könnten die Universitätskliniken viel mehr noch machen, als sie jetzt tun, wenn sie mehr Geld hätten. Aber Geld ist nun mal endlich. Damit muss man dann irgendwie auch leben. Und man könnte besser leben im Sinne von Patienten, wenn man besser zusammenarbeiten würde. In der Universität, ich sage mal Forschung und Krankenversorgung, aber natürlich auch darüber hinaus in den Environments, die man eben findet. In Berlin, in Heidelberg, auch in Bonn. Wenn man sagt, wir müssen uns mehr zusammentun, gemeinsam Ressourcen nutzen und uns auch gemeinsam aufstellen um eben stärkere Verhandlungspartner zu sein, als wenn jeder alleine irgendwo hingeht. Und natürlich auch, wir haben auch außerhalb der akademischen Medizin ja viele Partner, die wir mit einbeziehen können. Also gerade eben auch die großen Labore hier, in, die eben genomische Medizin oder genomische Diagnostik betreiben. Man muss Netzwerke bilden. Ich weiß nicht, warum das damals so gut geklappt hat mit Translate Hamse, mit diesen sieben Zentren, die zusammenzufassen. Und es hat doch auch Erfolg gehabt. Es gibt jetzt Zentren. Und es gibt ein, immerhin gibt es die Selektivverträge. Wenn man zusammenarbeitet, kann man viel mehr schaffen, als wenn jeder in seinem Silo sich bewegt. Auch auf Deutsch, tut mir leid. Ähm, ist einfacher. Es geht ums Datenteil und ich glaube, viele von uns wollen die genetischen Daten teilen. Wir müssen die teilen. Das generiert wahnsinnig viel Wissen. Wir alle halten uns auch an den Hürden, die da vorhanden sind. Wie, wie ist Ihre persönliche Meinung? Wie kann man mal das kommen, dass man das ein bisschen pragmatischer hinkriegt? Alle Patienten und Patienten wollen das. Haben alle. Ich sehe, da, ich sehe da durchaus eine Bewegung. Also der Broad Consent ist zum Beispiel ein Riesenfortschritt, wenn wir den haben. Also das glaube ich, auch die, die, die Art und Weise, wie Daten gemanagt werden, also die, die Federated System, ist ja eine Riesenhilfe. Also ich glaube, da, da werden Hürden auch weiter noch hochgehalten, die eigentlich schon keine mehr sind. Und wie Sie sagen, Datenschutz, die Patienten, wenn man sagt, es ist eben ein Consent-Way und nicht ein Opt-out-Way, die, die meisten Patienten, zumindest die mit, mit seltenen Erkrankungen, aber ich glaube auch die mit Krebserkrankungen, unterschreiben sowieso alles, was man denen hinlegt. Weil die wissen, nur eben dadurch wird es für sie weitergehen. Also das halte ich 
Das war sicherlich vor zehn Jahren noch sehr, sehr anders, aber da hat sich so viel bewegt, dass ich glaube, dass man tatsächlich nicht mehr das als Vorwand nehmen darf, wenn die Dinge nicht vorangehen. Ich wollte das nur sehr begrüßen, weil ich glaube, es gäbe keine bessere Idee, als die Genomdaten zusammenzufassen. Das ist eine super sinnvolle Sache. Das stärkt uns auch gegenüber den anderen Ländern oder der USA. Wir haben bisher, leben wir von deren Datenschatz. Wenn das für uns nicht mehr erhältlich wäre, hätten wir alle ein großes Problem. Ich denke, deswegen da ist wirklich dieses Wort Kooperation total wichtig. Und da würde ich mich auch freuen, wenn wir da beitragen können. Ich war ja auch zehn Jahre mittendrin in diesem ganzen Hin und Her und habe die Gesundheitsforschung der Helmholtz ein paar Jahre geleitet. Aus meiner Sicht hat in Deutschland die Allianz komplett versagt. Allianz heißt die Führung von Max Planck, Helmholtz, Leibniz auf der Universitäten. Bei der Entstehung der Gesundheitsforschungszentrum gab es erst mal ein paar Jahre Kompetenzgerangel. Das Geld sollte zu uns und nicht dahin und die haben genug und das ist ja nur eine Verschiebung. Hat nur zu Mauern geführt. Das Wasser ist ein Rhein runter, aber wenn man nach vorne schaut, dann glaube ich, gehört hier jetzt der Wissenschaftsrat rein, der eine ganz starke Empfehlung macht. Ich habe das zum Teil in Saarbrücken bei der Begutachtung erlebt, wo eine starke Empfehlung gemacht wurde. Ihr habt hier, wenn ihr so weitermacht, keine Chance, wenn ihr nicht also das macht. Und ich glaube, eine konzertierte Aktion, die vorbesprochen sein muss, so wie die Physiker das machen bei ihren Großforschungszentren, äh, ist essentiell. Und das geht natürlich nur über Führung von ein paar Leuten, die ja, das Motto, was ich gestern Abend, glaube ich, versucht habe, rüberzubringen in der Führung, keiner arbeitet für mich, ich arbeite für euch und so ein Gremium muss für Deutschland arbeiten und nicht für das DKFZ und die Charité oder äh, Frankreich oder Berlin. Wer aber noch? Und die Universitäten und die Helmholtz-Zentren sollten sich alle mal fest an der Nase fassen. Ja aber, ich, ja, aber ist ja im Moment so das, was wir am liebsten gerade sagen. Ja, alles richtig, aber es ist natürlich so, ich, da ich ja zweimal falsch abgebogen bin in dieser Position, man wird dermaßen oder man steht sowas von unter Druck, dass natürlich man immer auch aufgefordert wird, auch von Aufsichtsräten, Politik und sonstigen, dass man einen Job hat, denn nur abzielt darauf, die eigene Institution nach vorne zu bringen. Und es geht den Helmholtz-Direktoren und den anderen auch nicht anders. Äh, da muss ein komplett anderes Mindset rein. Ja, ja. Genau, dann brauchen wir exekutive Kräfte, sozusagen praktisch, dass die Aufgaben Gesundheitsministerium oder Wissenschaftsministerium eben Deutschland nach vorne zu bringen und das Gemeinwohl, die müssen dann sozusagen die Schiedsrichterfunktion übernehmen, sozusagen. Klar, natürlich hat jetzt unsere Regierung andere Sorgen im Laufe der Weltgeschichte, die ich jetzt nicht kommentieren möchte, aber wir sollten sozusagen das nicht vergessen. Und ich glaube, Sie, so ein Perkendor immer wieder auch in den, sagen wir, was Sie wahrscheinlich auch machen, bei den Politikern ist der wichtig, sozusagen, dass wir uns erinnern, es geht um diese Kinder, die unsere Zukunft sind. Sie hatten noch einen Kommentar. Sie haben Zukunftsabschnitt, das ist richtig. Ja. Mein Name ist Norbert van Rooij. Ich äh, arbeite für Oxford Nanopur. Ähm, Ihre Präsentation ist absolut klasse, super. Ähm, wenn es einen Fanclub äh, gibt, dann würde ich mich jetzt anmelden. Ähm, äh, gleichzeitig, Sie haben gesagt, ähm, de patiënt, das ist warum es geht. Das Blöde ist, dass jede Patientendiskussion auf, ähm, auf nationaler Ebene immer versandet in ein Erstattungsdiskussion. Und da kommen wir nicht weiter momentan damit. Ähm, wenn wir richtig weiter 
gehen wollen, dann muss die Diskussion auf eine Wirtschaftsebene gebracht werden. Da muss also in das Thema, wo alles sich momentan mit beschäftigt ist, wie wird die Industrie, wie wird die Wirtschaft besser gemacht. Und ähm, Genomics, Omics, das ist ein extremer Faktor, kann ein extremer Faktor für die Wirtschaft sein. Wir haben letzte Woche, of diese Woche war es, Habeck zijn, zijn plannen gezien. Eigenlijk had ik erwacht dat er daar een kapitel genomics erin is. Is er niet? Kiep dus met geen woord wordt ook nog maal erin gemaakt. Wil het zin maken om um, ohne de patiënt uit zijn ogen te verliezen? Maar deze argumenten, dat is niet nur de der einzelinteresse van, van de einzelne patiënt, is de, die kans wichtig is, die waar het dus absoluut geeft. Maar dat is ook een nationaal belang gibt voor, uh, voor de toekomst. Ja, ik heb het ja versucht aan te duiden, ook met deze slide uit Genomics England, waar die ja ook kalkuliert hebben wat was de benefit is. Er gibt da daarvoor ook daten ook uit Deutschland, wat die krankenversorging angeht, dat die durchaus günstiger werden kan. Maar er gibt collega's, ik zeg maar van mij, die lopen rond en zeggen, huch, es wird alles viel zu teuer, das können wir alles nicht leisten. Und das ist doch der, Inno das ist ja quasi, wie ich immer sage, suicidal. Wie kann man rumlaufen und sagen, wenn man, wenn man selber Wissenschaftler oder Wissenschaftlerin ist, es wird alles so teuer, besser man macht es gar nicht. Das ist ja furchtbar. Also, aber es gibt genügend Zahlen, die genau das Gegenteil eben auch zeigen. Das Beispiel ist Biontech, die die Studie in England durchführt. Die zahlen wie viel? Drei Milliarden in, in Mainz an Steuer. Und davon geht jetzt ein Teil nach England. Ja, naja, na ja, ja, klar. Die, die klinischen Studien wandern alle ab. Na, nein, wir haben hier ein Riesenproblem. Das geht weit über die Kinder mit seltenen Erkrankungen hinaus. Aber ich habe es heute mal darauf fokussiert, weil das auch meine Area ist. Gut. Ich glaube, das war eine sehr anregende Diskussion. Wir müssen jetzt weiter und an die nächste Generation der Wissenschaftler denken. Jetzt kommen die Preise und die Vorträge der Preisträger. Also wer ist das Preiskomitee? Ja, sozusagen. So. Hello everyone for the last session, the poster prize session online and on site. Um, my name is Tori Panta. I'm a clinician working at the University Hospital in Aachen. And also I'm here to present the young generation of the AGD. So before diving into the announcement of for this year's winners, let's hear from the two of the last year's winners um, who will give short talks about the progress of their research. First one, we will hear an update of our second prize winner, Hannah Klinkhammer on SNP Boost. Uh, maybe you remember the talk from last year. We see how the project progresses. So, uh, I have a couple too many slides for this <laughs> short update, but um, I will just skip through them. So I thought it's best if I can uh, remind you really quickly what we're trying to do. So uh, we are working on polygenic risk scores. Uh, which are usually uh, based on GWAS. Uh, so they are fitted based on univariate models. And our idea was to fit actually a multivariable model. And we wanted to use statistical boosting for that. So I will not go into detail now, but you can see that boosting is a um, really modular algorithm. And what we are focused on now in this project that I will present today is this loss function, uh, which basically determines the outcome uh, which we can model. So this is our algorithm, but as I said, uh, I will not go into detail. Just the idea was that we build batches of variants so that we can effect, uh, efficiently um, work on this large genotype data. 
so here are the results that are um, not that new actually. So those are for continuous and binary outcomes. Um, this is what is usually done in the PRS field. You define your outcome um, as a, a continuous measurement. Uh, for example, here you can see LDL uh, cholesterol or a binary outcome. Uh, and we also did that and we can do that by using as a loss function, the L2 loss or the log loss. Uh, and for the LDL, you can actually see that we are able to capture the um, or some genetic information and we add information uh, compared to the covariates only, which were sex, age, and the 10 first principal components. And for high blood pressure, which is then a binary outcome, we could see that actually the PRS that we uh, fitted, so this is always on the test data, what I show you here, uh, was shifted towards the right. So we can see um, at least a small difference between uh, controls and cases. And of course, it's not perfect because not all the information is captured in the common variants. But now we were thinking about what uh, do we do about other data types? Because usually we also have time to event data or count data, which are in particularly um, often skewed data. And we want to fit something that is called quantile regression. So usually this is just done, for example, for time to event data, you still just fit a binary PRS by considering the occurrence of the disease and then use it in a consecutive step in a Cox model. But we actually want to um, um, uh, want to optimize the PRS for this time to event data. So here you can see the results, which we uh, have for the age of onset on, of asthma. So we use as a loss function then the negative likelihood of an AFT model um, probably you don't know the AFT model, but, but what it does, it, it models the logarithm of the survival time. Uh, and then you can see here, if you want to know any details, you can ask me later about that. But you can see that we can actually stratify uh, the risk, the cumulative incidence uh, based on the PRS category. And then uh, another which I find quite interesting approach is quantile regression. So what we actually do is we want to fit a PRS to predict the individual quantile of a patient based on the genetic information. And what it looks like is like that for BMI, for example. So the gray dots uh, are the actual BMI values. Uh, the blue dots are the 90% quantiles. Uh, the red dots, the 10% quantiles. And the um, green dots are the medians. So the estimated medians based on the genetic information. Uh, and what we observed is, for example, that here, um, the so we can build um, prediction intervals, actually, uh, when we just consider the 10% quantile and the 90% quantile. And we could see that the length of those prediction intervals uh, are actually associated with the median BMI as well. So this is uh, what we consider, that the genetics not only have an influence on the level of the trait, but also on the variance. So here's a short wrap up. Uh, so we have now implemented um, many loss functions in our framework. Um, so we can fit continuous data and also quantile regression for continuous data, but we can also now fit binary data, time to event data and count data. I think that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. There was quite a hard break from the discussion before now to the next scientific talk, but is there a question? has formed in your minds for Hannah. Okay, then due to time, we move directly then to the next talk. Thank you very much. So last year, our first winner also came from the IGSB. It was Sebastian Rasman, and he will take us again to a deep dive into the eye of bone to gene. So we're in for your talk.
Uh, so sorry for the delay. Hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, so I'll give a quick back um, quick update on the Born to Gene project, which also won um, the last year's poster prize. So we'll give a big um, overview about the project and also the topic covered in the um, last year's poster. And as mentioned, I work at the LGSP at the group of Ben and German audience also in um, in the audience. Um, so the basic idea of the project was to take next generation phenotyping and also expand it from face and fundus images where it has been established to um, uh, skeletal disorders. And we picked hand x-rays for practical reason for this to start with. So um, in the course of this project, we faced uh, the main challenges that just data is really sparse and also highly heterogeneous so that um, the site from which the image was acquired is imprinted to the image uh, such that this would bias the downstream model that we use for um, prioritizing or classifying um, disorders. So um, one approach that we took to um, encounter sparsity um, was pre-training the models. So instead of training um, the models directly on a uh, small set of actual disorder data, we tried to pre-train it on a proxy task, which in this case was volume prediction for which there is a big um, data set available. So um, this was the initial motivation for the model that we now term the pleasure, which is a bonus assessment tool. So after establishing this, uh, we actually just checked if the model would also work for the smallest other data. And it turned out that the approach that we took is actually quite suited to um, not classify the disorders, but to actually get the bone age on um, skeletal dysplasias, which usually is quite a challenge because the bones are just shaped anomaly. So it's a challenge for existing tools as well as for um, clinicians. Um, so yeah, this was last year's um, poster. And um, just to give you a quick um, overview about uh, what we found and about the pleasure. So um, basically we showed that um, our approach um, achieves state-of-the-art performance on public benchmarking sets of um, healthy patients. And we um, compiled the data set that we call GDBD um, as a set of um, uh, hand x-rays of um, with annotated bone age as a crown proof and um, yes, different um, skeletal dysplasias. And then this we achieve also, um, uh, we, we didn't see any decrease in performance. So we assume that uh, the models just generalize um, without any loss of um, performance to these uh, dysplasias. Also, we can show that um, actually um, cases rejected by existing clinical use tools uh, marked with the stars here um, can be um, covered by, by our tool. And on the remaining, uh, on the remaining cases, um, our model is actually more precise than uh, these, these tools, which are actually already in clinical use. And finally, we can also show that um, for basically a simulated reassessment of patients, we get a really high accuracy, which is even better than a um, a blind uh, rating of, of these cases. Um, so our models are also applicable for um, basically consecutive assessments and uh, we have for longitudinal data. Um, yeah, so while we have some uh, quite some success in uh, this bone age task, which should only be like a side project, um, for our main project, we, we still um, struggle with uh, the sparsity of the data. So we hope to expand uh, the database in the future. We also have this problem with the bias where we have some technical issues, but in the end, um, we, we really are um, desperate to, to receive more data. And um, if we are happy to collaborate if, if you happen to have this data. Um, and yeah, contact me or um, Venom, who's in the back, to, um, to discuss. So, thanks. Thank you. So congratulations to your first authorship uh, publication that came out this year. Are there is there one question maybe for the audience? Otherwise, we move on. There is a poster you also already submitted for this year's conference. So if anyone is interested, take a look online at the platform at the poster. So now the moment you've all been waiting for this year's poster award winners. Highlighted yesterday, our winners will not only receive their well-deserved accolades, but are also awarded their prize money in Bitcoin again. And additionally, they have the exciting opportunity to return next year to share the insights on how their projects were going on in the next year. So our third place uh, winner 
uh, has put in remarkable effort with the GMBDB, the Gestalt Metro Database. And please welcome our dedicated clinician and human geneticist from Bonn, Helen Nessmann. Some time to take a look uh, at the poster online if you have your smartphones or uh, tablets ready in the meantime. Hey, um, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for um, voting for my poster. So I'm really happy to tell you more about the database. I guess a lot of you already heard of the Gestaltmatch AI and also of the database. And um, I'm glad to now give you an update. So um, we started, or the GMDB journey started uh, when we were developing the Gestaltmatch AI and an AI. An AI to, to detect facial phenotypes from uh, frontal images of patients with facial dysmorphism. And um, so um, we realized that there was not really the data available to train the model, and um, the data was siloed over different sources. So um, we then started this huge curation effort and collected uh, from now the state um, 8,970 cases in the GMDB and in the beginning the majority was collected from publications um, but as you can see we also started to um, recruit patients from patient support groups and also from clinicians all over the world um, which recruited the patients from their daily work basis. Um, the data that is stored in the Gestaltmatcher database is like, um, uh, it's in MySQL database that stores sex, ethnicity, and if it's from a publication, it also stores the PubMed ID and DOI and the corresponding author. And um, also the diagnose disorder, of course, and molecular information so that we know which was the molecular diagnosis and uh, some phenotypic information in HPO terms. Um, and also not only we only don't store facial photographs, but also um, it's possible to store any uh, image data. So portrait, profile, limbs, MRI, X-rays, phonoscopy, and so on. And um, the data can be stored uh, publicly or privately. So we distinguish between those two um, because um, there is the there is the fair principles, which are um, which should say that the data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, so it can be also used uh, for machine learning. And um, there are also the private cases. Uh, these are cases that are only visible to uh, the phys physicians who have uploaded their cases, and um, they are not according uh, are not relying to the fair principles. So in the end, um, all the all the uh, data in the um, Gestaltmatcher database is used to train the Gestaltmatcher AI model. Um, and also private cases can be used by the clinician who uploaded the private cases to um, do some analysis with the Gestaltmatcher algorithm. But these private cases are not shown in the gallery view, so they are not accessible to the scientific community or the users of the Gestaltmatcher database. And this is what the goal of the FAIR principle is. Like we talked uh, much about data sharing um, now, and this is our main goal to make this database accessible. 
Um, so clinicians can use this also as a reference database, and it can also be seen as a modern publication medium. So right now, at this time, we have collected 1,243 frontal images of about 500 patients that haven't been published elsewhere. So it's as uh, new data. We also have here the numbers for um, limbs, profile, and so on. Um, and um, also our aim is to make this data set balanced, as balanced as possible. So we aim also to um, accomplish that there are many ethnicities in, um, and that these ethnicities right now are currently underrepresented in many databases. So right now still, as you can see here, we have mainly Caucasian ethnicities in the database, but our aim is with the uh, um, global collaborations to increase these numbers here as well. And another thing that uh, the GMDB or as a modern publication um, or what an advantage of this modern publication medium is, that it accomplished the fact that uh, patients can uh, change over time. So the facial features can change or also um, other uh, features uh, might, uh, might develop over time. And a case in the GMDB can be updated at any time uh, while a publication um, in a print journal, we will never know what happens to the patient afterwards if there's not follow-up paper on it. And this can also be used, of course, for training uh, of the AI process um, uh, of training the uh, AI, which can also improve the performance, uh, as you will hear uh, in a later presentation. So another uh, great thing is that it's, according to the fair principles, reusable and interoperable. So you can use it to compare your cohorts um, if, uh, with all the data that is inside uh, of the GMDB. And um, also the FAIR data can be used by other researchers to train their AI models. Of course, after they uh, applied with an IRB approved research proposal, but um, then it's like a FAIR database, which can be also used to train other models. And um, also, um, as you may know, there is a lot of uh, efforts to match patients based on their molecular information and um, uh, for example, like gene matcher, um, but gestalt matcher can also be incorporated in this matchmaker exchange network to match patients based on their um, facial features. And yeah, the GMDB is, as I said, only accessible to the scientific community. So you um, need to be registered to see these patients. And this is only accessed by invite only um, for this conference. If you're not registered yet, you can scan a QR code. And um, what I also didn't say is that also patients can access the database. So if they um, use a digital consent form, then they can uh, anytime uh, they can register in the database and can um, access their data anytime. And they can also upload data themselves so that uh, follow up of, uh, of of the facial features over time and um, would be easier. Um, yeah, and if you there's already a preprint, so if you'd like to read more about it, then you could also scan this QR code. So thank you for your attention. That is a great community effort. We talked a lot about communities yesterday and we heard about it in the keynote. So we came to the second place, uh, representing the seamless blend of AI and genetics, Alexander Hastings. Through his commendable work with multiple images from one patient from the GMDB, he's enhanced the performance in GMARC. All right. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, first off, let me thank you for the nominations. Um, they're very uh, well received. Uh, I hope to not disappoint with the further clarifications that I give on the project. And I hope to be able to, let's say, convince the rest to uh, 
that the project is still a good idea and it works quite well at this moment. Although, of course, there's room for improvement. So I'll be presenting my project on improving a Gestalt Matcher using multiple images. And more importantly, we're using early fusion, which I'll explain later, uh, to improve the diagnostic yield, as well as the um, speed and efficiency. Right. So I'll start with some background. So in the current state, um, most of the next generation phenotyping models or tools they that focus on like dysmorphic faces only use a single photo. And I'm not sure how most parents are, but my parents, uh, they do have multiple pictures of me when I was a child. Um, so why not use multiple of these when you can, when they're available? Um, and even in the cases where they are available, oftentimes they're not used or the analyses are not being combined. Um, similarly, um, more of the prevalent disorders uh, occur more frequently in databases, such as our database, Gestalt Metro database, um, and that leads to problems down the line. So I have a little image on the right. Some of you might recognize it from the Gestalt Metro publication in 2022. Um, I altered the image slightly, so the yellow dots, uh, the, sorry, the gray dots on the bottom right um, are very few dots. So let's say this is a more rare um, disorder while all the other disorders are represented more fully, which means if there was some randomness or uncertainty in the model, it's more likely that it will be matched to one of the more frequent disorders. And this is something I'll come back to later. Um, next, the other problem we have is that it doesn't really scale that well. So this is the publication 2023. Um, and the main problem is if the models become more complex and take more time to process one image, what happens when you want to use multiple images? What happens when you go from one image to three or maybe 10? It takes more and more and more time. So let me get into what our approach does. So like I mentioned, we use early fusion, which basically say, stating is we're merging like an image representation before we calculate the distances. So on the top row, you see the original approach and on the bottom row, we see the revision. So basically we convert, um, well, I'll, I'll walk you through. So we see first one image, which is being converted into four images with something called test time augmentation. This is something we looked at in the previous publication, which improved performance by improving robustness. Um, we go to a model, we compute a representation of that image for each of the uh, test time augmentations. We compute the distances for each of those. We compute the uh, average of those distances. And afterwards, we compute the most likely disorders, or at least the most similar disorders. As you can already see with the comparison below, this isn't really as efficient as it could be. So with our revision, we now, instead of fusing them at a late point, what we did in the green parts over here, we fuse them as early as possible. So we're saving a lot of time, as well as basically creating a patient representation rather than an image representation. Um, similarly, uh, yeah, like that. <laughs> um, similarly, um, we do the same for a disorder representation. So basically, we're not looking at every image distance to every patient in our gallery set, but we're looking for every patient representation to every disorder representation, which saves us, again, a lot of time. Because you have to imagine that, let's say, we have 9,000 images, but 400 disorders. We are, instead of multiplying it by 9,000, we're multiplying it by 400. This is a representation of that as well. So the stars in the centers of each of those circles are the cluster centroids or the so-called disorder representations. And as you can imagine, there's far fewer centroids than there are data points in general. So a little bit about our data that we used for this experiment. Uh, so we collected multiple photos for three Klefsa uh, patients. And after quality control, we were left with about 250 images with an age range between seven and 66 months. Um, and for our experimental setup, we basically sample first a single photo, and next we wanted to sample two additional photos. So in this case, we want to use three pictures per test. This could also be 10 or whatever other number. Um, and basically, we can either sample within a range. So let's say we want to be within two months older or younger, or we sample it throughout whatever is available. Uh, and lastly, we combine those, so the approach that we listed earlier, and we compare that to the best single performance for photos. And it gives us these results. So first, I'll go into the accuracy. Um, not to bore everyone too much, uh, but on the right, you see the, the mean top N accuracy. Basically, 
top n accuracy, let's say top one means the first prediction is correct. Top five means that within the top five, like within the first five predictions, your prediction is correct. So basically you can see that over time it improves a lot where the yellow one was the original approach and the blue one is the, the final approach that we present here. Uh, if we look at solely the top one performance, we increase from about 42% to about 85%. Similarly for the speed, like I mentioned, there's a lot of efficiency to be gained and reducing all this complexity at an earlier point, we see that it's speeding up from about like a little over a second to one tenth of a second which in general doesn't sound like that much. But again, if you're considering to use three photos or 10 photos or more or more, this can be a problem. So now I'd like to thank all the collaborators and everyone that helped me with the project. And there's time for questions. Congratulations. Uh, I think we have moved the question to the lunch break then and move on with the first place. Having previously enlightened us on a different topic, today she'll delve into the utilization of Gestalt Metro for variant classification via ACMG criteria. Congratulations again, Hannah Klinkhammer. Um, okay, so thank you very much for voting. Um, and I, like as Tori already said, this is about a, another project. Oh, wait, I cannot see just a bit loud enough. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so uh, this is not about polygenic risk scores, but uh, about the um, downstream analysis of the Gestalt matter results. So our motivation was that uh, we now have many next generation phenotyping approaches. Um, however, we want to uh, now use them to quantify actually the um, evidence level of a phenotypic match. So we're talking about the ACMG criteria and so far this PP4 criterion uh, serves as supporting evidence except for some exceptions where you could argue for a, a higher evidence level. So what we now want to do is we want to make use of those Gestalt scores or in general phenotypic scores that you can derive and uh, use them to actually as objectively as possible um, quantify the evidence level of a phenotypic match. So to do that we use the Bayesian ACMG framework which was uh, introduced by Teftigian et al. And the idea is um, quite statistical but in uh, principle quite uh, easy to understand so what we can do is we can calculate odds of pathogenicities um, I will now sometimes call them odds of pathogenicity or positive likelihood ratio but in principle that's the same thing um, and you can imagine if we have a given test we can calculate this number and in this patient framework they then match this number, some thresholds for this number, to the ACMG evidence level. So you can see that if we have a likelihood ratio of 350, which is quite large, uh, then it's a very strong evidence level um, and so on. So here in the middle, we can see an example how we use that now to quantify the evidence level of a phenotypic match to the Cornelia de Lange syndrome. So as a Gestalt score, we now refer to the highest a similarity to a patient which we know has Cornelia de Lange syndrome. And for training, we used 351 Cornelia de Lange syndromes and 351 random patients that are not healthy controls, but patients who have another disorder. Uh, and what we do now is we compute the Gestalt scores for each of those 682 patients to Cornelia de Lange syndrome. Uh, and then we have another test set of 36 Cornelia de Lange patients and 36 random patients, um, which have not been trained by Gestalt Matcher and of course were not included in this training of the threshold that I will now talk about. So our idea is we want to come up with a threshold so that we have a binary test basically. So uh, we want to say that if our patient that we are testing now has a Gestalt score of uh, a value greater than C, uh, then we want to say, okay, then we're pretty sure that he has Cornelia de Lange syndrome. Um, and on the other hand, if uh, the patient has a value lower than C, we want to say, okay, probably it's another syndrome. 
Um, so this is why we use random patients. So it's about differential diagnostics here. And then, um, as I said, for the training set, we calculate all the Gestalt scores and then we end up with something that looks like this. Um, but I don't want to bore you with the training now. Uh, so what we do is we conduct a rock analysis and then define the threshold that's achieving the highest sensitivity and specificity. So when I say both, I just take the sum. So it's equally weighted. And then uh, you can see here the results on the test set. So on those 36 patients. In this um, image, you can see the histogram of the Gestalt scores of the controls, which are the random patients, and the cases, which are the Cornelia de Lange patients. And you can clearly see that they there is a slight overlap, but uh, they are quite different. So the, um, the Cornelia de Lange patients, uh, on average, show a higher Gestalt score. Um, and then uh, this vertical line is the threshold we came up with. So you can see that there are some red observations uh, on the left-hand side of the threshold, which means they are misclassified in this case. Um, so you can actually see the results in this contingency table. So uh, the one on the so the 32 patients were correctly classified as having Cornelia de Lange syndrome, four were misclassified, and all random patients were actually uh, correctly classified as. Um, not having Cornelia de Lange syndrome. And if we then calculate the likelihood ratio, it's around 33, which when we go back to the Teftigian paper, we see corresponds to a strong evidence level. So actually what that means is when we now have a patient that so far only fulfilled the, or a variant, uh, the, fulfilled the PM2 criterion, and we can find a phenotypic match to the Cornelia de Lange syndrome, then we could actually upgrade this VAS from being a VAS to uh, being likely pathogenic. Um, so maybe to conclude really quickly, um, those thresholds we derive with and also the evidence levels are syndrome specific. Uh, so we have to do that for every syndrome uh, separately. Um, and But we can use this framework to quantify the evidence level. Uh, I think I will leave it at that. Uh, there's also a publication with Helen and uh, Peter um, in the Medizinische Genetik where there is a short example uh, where we tried to um, explain how we did this method. But of course, you can also reach out to uh, me or any of us if you want to know more details. Thank you. And again, congratulations for winning again a poster <laughs> prize at the Thank ADD. You. And I think we're all looking forward to what you work on in the next year, in the next year's ADD, where you have another presentation as well as the other two poster prize winners. Um, maybe you can come to the stage after the session so we can take a photo of all our poster prize winners. And then, thank you. Thank you. So post lunch, I invite all of you that are interested to accompany me to the Bundeskunsthalle. So it promises an enriching experience of art and history. So those keen, please just come to me after lunch. And as we draw this year's HD to a close, we extend our gratitude for all of